What's happening guys? Keith here with another Impact Wrestling Review. So normally I do a weekly Impact Review along with an episode of the Impact Report. However, it's been a kind of slow news week, so I figured I'm just going to combine the two and do an Impact Super Show. So this week's episode opens with a very well done video package kind of previewing what was going to happen throughout the night. Um, like I said, very well put together, very professional. I one thing that Impact always does right is their video packages. They're always very consistent with this, and uh, it definitely adds to the product. So we have our first match of the evening, and it is Scott Steiner and Eli Drake defending their tag team titles against ZNE, DJ Z and Andrew Everett. I always like when we start off the show with a match. Impact does that on a regular basis. Um, so like I said, that's, that's how I always like to open the shows. But uh, this was a fun match. Uh, speed versus strength here. Uh, we got limited stuff from Scott Steiner, so Eli Drake had to do the majority of the work. Uh, we did, however, see Scott Steiner hit a Samoan drop from the top rope. So, you know, Scott Steiner's always got to have his one move during the matches. A um, couple cool spots. Eli went to set up DJ Z for the gravy train. Andrew Everett came in over, and the two ended up turning it into a code red breaker. Very cool spot. Uh, they got a near fall on that. Scott Steiner, obviously frustrated, outside the ring, goes and grabs a chair. He goes to hit DJ Z, who kind of pokes his head through the ropes, but uh, inadvertently hits Eli Drake after Eli pulls DJ Z away. Uh, at this point, Eli spills to the middle of the ring. Andrew Everett comes running in with a shooting star press, and we have new tag team champions. Um, not a huge surprise here. I didn't expect their reign to last this long. And we saw a little bit of dissension between Drake and Steiner last week and the miscommunication this week. So I'm wondering if we're going to get a small program between the two. Um, I like the team of uh, DJ Z and Andrew Everett. Uh, great to see both guys back. And, uh, you know, if they didn't really have much going on, this was the perfect thing for them to do. Put them together as a team. Obviously, one part that Impact has been lacking is their tag team division. These guys are just going to... I mean, I feel like most of the tag teams are wrestle that X Division style, so this only made sense. Um, and I believe next week they will face OVE. I'm pretty sure it's a non-title match, but that should be a great match as well. So let me go backstage, and we see Andrew Everett and DJ Z both celebrating. They get bum-rushed by Petey Williams, who is very happy for them. But uh, they basically say that they overcame injuries, and they're just getting started. So we head over to the virtual studio, and we find out that Madison Rain will be doing commentary for the Knockouts matches. I don't know if I'm in the minority here, but I feel like this is kind of very gimmicky. If you're going to have her do it, just have her do it throughout the whole show, as Josh Matthews was doing commentary solo this week again uh, with Impact selling the injury to Don Callis at the hands of Sammy Callahan a couple weeks back, so... Just a small thing, I like the two-man commentary team. I mean, Josh did pretty good throughout the night, um, but it feels much better with two people, and the husband and wife team worked because uh, the next match matchup, they're uh, on commentary together, and that is Kiara Hogan versus Tessa Blanchard. This was made last week. The crowd was pretty behind Kiara. Um, both women looked good in the match. We all knew that Tessa was not going to lose her debut match, but... Um, you know, Kiara still looked good in the match. Um, pretty fluid match. Uh, not much else to say. Tessa picks up the victory with the Hammerlock DDT. And uh, after the match, Tessa continues the beatdown. We had Madison go, you know what, I can't let this happen. So we see her come up the side entrance, uh, which was good. I mean, obviously, they're not there doing commentary. This is all dubbed after the fact. But the fact that they had her come up the side ramp, oh, I, I like that. It's the little things rather than her just come out, you know, and have a full entrance and everything. Um, crowd really wasn't too crazy when she came out. You would have figured they would have been a little more excited to see her. But uh, she comes out, kind of scares Tessa off. She just runs away. And then we find out at two we in two weeks that uh, Tessa Blanchard will face Madison Rain at Under Pressure, which is their TV pay-per-view show. Um, I think Rain is going to be a good opponent for Tessa. She's a well-established wrestler, and it won't do harm to any of the current knockouts because they don't really have people to build up new talent. I mean, we lost, what, Ava Story, and uh, I forget who else the other one was that kind of 
well, basically job to the new women coming in. Um, so we, I like this segment up next, and that's uh, we go backstage, and actually it's happened earlier in the day. Uh, Congo Kong and Jimmy Jacobs are talking, and Grado comes up and accuses them of attacking Joseph Park last week. Uh, Jacob says, if you want to make accusations, you will be laid out next, and there will be no question who did it this time. Uh, at, at this point, Katarina steps in, and she says, my man is not scared of you, and will fight you any place. At this point, Grado's kind of like, no, I don't want to do that. I, I didn't say that. And Jacobs kind of gets in his face and goes, consider it done. Uh, like I said, well done segment. Um, you kind of continue what happened last week. And uh, it was a way for Grado to have a match with Congo Kong kind of happen organically or naturally. Uh, like I said, I, I like that way of having matches put into the program. Um, after this, we get a promo uh, from Pentagon Jr. and Phantasma hyping the main event match throughout the evening or in the evening. Uh, they did a good job with this. Um, I, I kind of feel that Pentagon's reign has been a little... I don't know, not as good as I was hoping, just for the simple fact that, I guess, he came in, we didn't really get much information about him, we still don't know too much about the guy, um, He's this is really the first time I've seen him, as I haven't watched Lucha Underground, and I think a lot of other people haven't as well, they haven't done a good job of storytelling here, we don't know what his deal is, outside of him being brothers with Ray Phoenix, who we didn't see at all on the tapings, um, but I feel like they, they it's been a little lacking. I feel like they should have done a little more backstory on Pentagon Jr. So we really knew who the guy was rather than him coming in, winning the title on his first day. And that's basically all we have to run with. Um, he cut his promo in Spanish and Phantasma cut his in English, which was very good. Um, but yeah, so then we had the Grado vs. Congo Kong match. Um, well, I like that how the match came together. The match, though, eh. It was, it was a typical match you would expect out of the two of these guys. Um, it was somewhat entertaining. Grado's an entertaining character. I love his new entrance music. Um, Congo Kong obviously goes over here with the spa splash from the top rope. Um, after the match, Katarina kind of gets in the ring to, uh, I guess, pull Grado out, and she kind of takes one look at Jacobs and Kong and runs off to the back, leaving Grado in the ring by himself. Uh, at this point, Jacobs and Kong kind of try to give Grado the treatment that they gave Johnny Impact a couple weeks ago. But, unfortunately, Moose came out and saved the day. Uh, him and Congo Kong kind of had a little back and forth with Moose knocking Kong over the top rope and onto the outside. Uh, at this point, Congo Kong and Jimmy Jacobs kind of retreat to the back. So, we furthered the storyline between Congo Kong and... Moose, and I believe that match will take place next week between the two of them, actually in the Impact Zone this time. So, you know, overall, that was really what this whole thing was for. Uh, I, I'd like to see maybe Jimmy Jacobs and Kongo Kong kind of in a stable, just have Kong the powerhouse rather than the focus be on him. Um, just trying to figure out what to do with Kong here. I mean, there's only so much you can do with him. I really don't see him going over against Moose as Moose is... Mr. Impact Wrestling, so I don't know what their plan is after that. We see LAX walking outside the arena. Uh, they're on the phone trying to find answers still about everything going on. They get interrupted by the Cult of Lee. Uh, Cult of Lee make fun of them about losing their belts and say that last time they almost beat them. However, Conan was with them, and they think they can beat them this time. And we find out later on in the show that next week we will get the match of LAX versus the Cult of Lee. So we head over to House of Hardcore, and we see Tommy Dreamer talking to Eddie Edwards prior to the match. And Dreamer says that once you win, this will be over. Edwards says it won't be over until Callahan isn't breathing. So still going on, going strong here. Uh, and then we got the match between Eddie Edwards and Sammy Callahan, which was a street fight in House of Hardcore. Um, the... So the only problem I had with this match is the fact that the camera work was not that great. It seemed very jumpy at times. Half the time, the camera wasn't even focused on the competitors. And the crowd wasn't too hyped for a match of this caliper. So um, I would assume they're going to end up having like a no-sanction match or something like that at Slammiversary. 
Um, but, you know, outside that, the match was really good. I mean, you could obviously see how much these two despised each other. Uh, we got chairs, lead pipes, kendo sticks, and even a wet floor sign. Uh, Callahan hit a Death Valley driver on the entrance ramp. Uh, he also hit, like, a Michinoku driver through it. two chairs set up in the middle of the ring. Uh, Callahan grabbed the bat, ended up going toward Edwards. Edwards hits a Boston knee party, gains the victory. Um, the story, though, was that after the match, Eddie Edwards grabs that bat and starts choking Sammy Callahan. Um, the uh, House of Hardcore roster kind of comes out and separates the two, basically removing Edwards from Sammy Callahan. Um, Dreamer came out. He exchanged words with Eddie Edwards, kind of just obviously a disapproved look he gave him, and uh, Edwards has basically completely snapped and then uh, Josh Matthews mentioned on commentary, he said, uh, at what point does Eddie Edwards become the villain? And, you know, we've just entered a whole new part of this feud, which is great. And uh, looking forward to see where we go from here. Then we get the Brian Cage World Tour. He is, I believe, a Destiny Wrestling facing facade. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he goes over with Weapon X here. Not, not a huge surprise. Um Oh, this was a great segment. So we get footage from earlier on in the day where uh, Falava and KM kind of run into each other, and KM says, Fala? And he's like, I thought you were Enrique Iglesias. You look incredible. And so uh, KM tries to give him a makeover, and obviously that doesn't go as planned. So then uh, after that, we see KM and Ba walking backstage, and they kind of see they see Kiara Hogan out off to the side, and Ba kind of gives her the what's up nod, and Kiara's like, oh. <gasps> It was just, I love what they're doing with them here. You know, you don't have anything really going on for the two, so this is a perfect way to do it. Um, I believe we didn't get a Global Wrestling Network uh, flashback of the week this week. Um, it was funny because I actually watched the show on TV first time around, didn't take notes, just enjoyed the show. And then I went online and found the show and watched it, and... Instead of getting the Falaba and KM segment, they actually had the Global Wrestling Network rewind there. It was weird, um, but I don't recall seeing it on the television show itself. Um, and then up next, we got the Funeral for Rosemary, another well-produced segment. Um, so basically, this was intertwining all the events that happened in the Impact Zone between Sue Young and Rosemary uh, a couple weeks back. And we see the Undead Bridesmaids carry... The coffin through a cemetery. Soo Young places some roses on it. Sprays red mist. Comes out. Changes the fire. Coffin burns. And that was that. Just well done. Um, and they wrote Rosemary off. Uh, I believe she got surgery on her ACL. So I don't know what the timeline for her to come back is. Hopefully it's Slammiversary. When we can actually get a match between the two. And that brings us to the main event. Matt Seidel and Austin Aries versus Pentagon Jr. and Phantasma. Um, not a huge surprise here that these four men were on, able to put on a great match. Uh, Josh did mention during commentary that Taiji Ishimori has gone on to join the Bullet Club, so I would assume that he is no longer with Impact. Hard to say, but just from that statement, it seemed that that was what happened. Uh, fans were behind the two luchadors. Not a huge surprise. Uh, we did have a scary spot for Phantasma as he went to hit the arrow from the depths of hell, and uh, his heels kind of hit the top rope as he went through, and he almost landed headfirst on the entrance ramp. Uh, he got up quickly, though, so he was all right. Um, then kind of the teams went back and forth. Uh, Pentagon Jr. and Phantasma were able to control a good portion of the match, double-teaming both Ares and Seidel. Then Ares and Seidel were able to go on the offensive by isolating Phantasma. Um, Aries and Seidel end up having incidental contact. Phantasma is able, a, able to make the hot tag. The two teams go back and forth. Uh, Matt Seidel sets up for the shooting star press on Phantasma, and as he's in midair turning, uh, Pentagon Jr. comes over and hits him with a super kick. Uh, Phantasma ends up hitting the thrill of the kill on Seidel for the win. Uh, good match, very enjoyable main event, and... The match next week between Matt Seidel and Phantasma for the X Division looks to be a fantastic match. And then in two weeks, Ares will get his rematch against Pentagon Jr. at Under Pressure. So, good stuff. Like I said, it was a good show overall. Very, very quick watch. I mean, uh, 
It didn't feel like it dragged. A little in the second hour when we had the uh, the Brian Cage match and the uh, Eddie Edwards and Callahan match just because it wasn't up to par with the Impact production, and I feel like that it just dragged at that point. Um, but this week's episode did 326,000 viewers, up from last week's 295,000 viewers, and ranked 108 on Cable's Top 150. So... That was good. Not a surprise for the ratings to go up here as we got the Callahan versus uh, Eddie Edwards street fight, which was, I'm, I'm sure, a big draw. No pun intended. And um, the main event was four big names. Uh, we did learn that Impact Wrestling will partner with AML Wrestling to produce a live Twitch show on July 29th. So that'll be a week after Slammiversary. Um, another promotion they're working with, and that should be good. Um, so, Don Callis was on this week's uh, Impact Media teleconference call. Uh, I'm not really going to go into detail of the call, just because, you know, Don kind of talked about the same thing that he's been preaching the whole time he's been here. But, two names did come up on the call, one being Rich Swan, and he is scheduled to be at the Windsor tapings in June, um, Seems like people are on the fence here with bringing in Rich Swan. I mean, you know, after the events that happened that led to his departure on WWE, and he had said that he was going to return to action, I believe, back in March, because he was actually scheduled to be at the House Hardcore show I went to, and uh, he pulled out of all the bookings and kind of no-showed all the events, I guess. Um, so I think people are a little worried that this is going to turn into another Alberto El Patron situation. Um, Don had mentioned during the call that Sue Young, which is his wife, uh, actually uh, wanted Impact to uh, give him a chance, so she was pushing for him, um, but you know, this is another thing that if it doesn't go well, this will reflect poorly on Sue Young. It's kind of like when uh, you tell your boss to uh, hire one of your friends and things don't work out, and that reflects poorly on you, but I mean, this isn't the same situation where Rich is a washed-up WWE wrestler. I mean, it was a shitty situation that led to his departure, um, which, oddly enough, was a domestic dispute with his wife, um, but that's all in the past now. Uh, he is an incredible in-ring performer, and I think he will be a great addition to the X Division. Uh, that's if he ends up getting signed. Um, but, you know, I'm all for second chances, and... Like I said, he's not a washed-up superstar that, you know, kind of had his time, and he's kind of looking for something else to do. Um, so, I don't know what you guys think about the situation. Let me know in the comment section below. But, like I said, I think he will do good for the X Division. Um, and the second being Enzo Amore. Um, so, he was cleared of all charges against him. Uh, Don was asked about this during the teleconference, and at first, when I heard Enzo and Impact Wrestling, you know, my first thought was, you know what, I will completely stop watching Impact Wrestling if Enzo shows up on, on the show. Uh, he caused, him basically showing up on 205 Live basically caused me to no longer have any interest in that show. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of his work, couldn't really stand him. I'm all for in-ring competition, and obviously that's not Enzo's thing. Uh, he turned out to be locker room cancer. I believe he had to, you know, get kicked out of the locker room. I believe he was thrown off a tour bus, and uh, he kind of just seemed like nothing but problems because, you know, when Don was asked about it, he said, you know, the normal line of never say never. So there is a flip side to this, however. He is a guy that did sell a ton of merchandise and always got the crowd into the product. Um, and if Impact Wrestling is looking to bring casual talent in, I feel like Enzo would be a name to do that. But, I mean, again, I, I'm so conflicted here. Hell, last, last month at WWE's Backlash pay-per-view during a match where Big Cass faced Daniel Bryan, there was a loud, we want Enzo chant. So there are people that still do want to see him. Um, like I said, I don't know if this is one of the situations where the bad outweighs the good, and I mean, it would seem like a typical TNA move of, you know, back in the day, where they bring a guy who's got bad stigma around him, just to kind of 
pop ratings and things like that. So, like I said, I'm conflicted. And hell, this may not even be an option in the future. So, just kind of throwing it out there, just making conversations, seeing what you guys think about this whole ordeal. Uh, let me know in the comment section below. That's pretty much all I have for you guys this week. Uh, I will see you next week, hopefully for a full lineup of an Impact Wrestling review along with an episode of the Impact Report. But until then, thanks for checking out my video, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks, guys. Bye.